Welcome to our second six-week series of conversations with noted presidential historians about the American presidency, brought to you by the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library, the UT Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and this year, Humanities Texas. I'm Phil Arms, and it's my privilege to chair the UT Ali Enrichment Committee. In 2022, we brought you a series of interviews with presidential biographers, each of whom offers special insights into the lives behind the legends of JFK, Nixon, Coolidge, Tyler, Jefferson, and Washington. Dr. Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Library and our good friend, and himself a widely respected historian was the host for each of these interviews. And Dr. Lawrence will again host each conversation this year, focusing on presidential decisions for war and peace. From these conversations, we will learn just how complex and difficult these decisions were and perhaps lessons for today. Our audience includes members and guests from the LBJ Library, friends, and from the four UT Ali organizations and from Humanities Texas. As a member of the audience, you may participate in the Q&A segment by using the chat function to write and submit questions. Our Q&A host today is my UT Ali colleague and good friend, Sandy Crest. Charlie Latterman, our guest historian is a senior lecturer in international history at King's College London and is coming to us today from London. He has taught as a visiting faculty member also at Stanford and at our own University of Texas. So Charlie Latterman, in a sense, welcome back. Throughout his career, he has worked to apply historical knowledge to contemporary political concerns. He's published widely in journals, newspapers, and books, including his masterful history of the progressive era in America. The book, Sharing the Burden, the Armenian Question, Humanitarian Intervention, and the Anglo-American Visions of Global Order. In this book, he writes brilliantly about decisions for peacemaking during the presidency of Woodrow Wilson at the end of World War I. Wilson himself was a scholar of the administrative state, the president of Preston University, the governor of New Jersey, and the 28th president of the United States. And perhaps importantly, he was also a Presbyterian elder, an idealist who deeply believed in the values embedded in the Protestant ethic that were and are essential to the founding and sustaining of liberal democracies. As president, his idealism helped shape his foreign policy for good or for ill, perhaps especially in his unfulfilled intention for the United States to be a part of the League of Nations and to aid the Armenian people who suffered perhaps one and a half million people killed in a genocide committed by the Ottoman Empire. And Charlie Lauterman writes, and I quote, sometimes it's simply not possible to achieve a good solution. So it is a great pleasure and anticipation that we welcome for today's interview, Charlie Lauterman, the author of Sharing the Burden, and now to Mark Lawrence. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome, and welcome especially to Charlie Laterman. Charlie, thank you so much for being with us um, for this first of six conversations with eminent scholars, as Phil just told us, uh, scholars who've written about decisions for war and peace across American history. It's, it's really fitting, I think, to begin uh, a series on presidential decision making about war and peace with the First World War a war that was unprecedented in its destruction, 
and certainly in its global consequences. In peacemaking at the end of the war, uh, notably the famous Treaty of Versailles, has been a major subject of interest, to put it mildly, for many, many years, um, as it still is and as it has been for more than a century now. It's no exaggeration, I think, to say that the World War I settlement has probably been more analyzed and debated than any other peacemaking exercise in all of, of global history. But Charlie, before we dive into Versailles and peacemaking itself, let's talk for a minute about the war itself. You, you've written, in fact, you say on the very first page of the book that Phil just mentioned, that the First World War was, and I quote here, the foundational crisis of the 20th century. Unpack that for us. What do you mean by that assertion? Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Phil, for that for that introduction. It's it's a pleasure to be back in uh, in Austin, even if only uh, virtually. And um, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this series, which is which is such a great initiative. And I, as you say, Mark, the First World War is this this foundational crisis, and I know that historians tend to have this sort of interconnected sense of events and what, where do we go back to in terms of trying to understand the origins of our present moment and you can keep sort of uh, unpacking, unpacking and, and unpeeling the onion. But I do think there is something foundational about the First World War because in many senses it marks the end of a period of, at least in Europe, quite remarkable um stability um, in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. And this is not to say that there's not conflict in Europe and also that there isn't sort of cataclysmic wars beyond Europe's borders. But when we look at the absence of great power conflict on the European continent from 1815 to 1914, a period of 99 years, I think to put that in context, for us since the Second World War, that period is only 78 years. So the, the, um, that, that period in the 19th century, the, the First World War brings to an end, is a, is a prolonged one. And, the, and so the way in which it sort of shakes the whole basis of international politics is, is profound. But it really is the, it, 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 it's a war on a scale that the world had never seen before. Um, and we can go into, I think, some of the, some of the first that the First World War represented. But I think um, one of the things that, 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 that it is, 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 the, is the first total war of the 20th century. And as, as one historian um, has, has put it, I think quite, quite aptly, it's the calamity from which other calamities spring, because not only does it signal the collapse of that European order that I discussed before, of that peace, um, that, 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 that long peace, that for the most part had um, characterized European politics, but it's also the downfall of four major multinational empires in the Tsarist Empire, um, the Ottoman Empire, the Habsburg Empire, and the German Empire. It's really also, um, it, it has, aside from sort of the policy, it's, it's the cultural impact of it, the way in which it sort of shakes a way of life. Um, and the way in which um, it, 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 it transforms social relations within Europe. But most importantly, of course, is the death and destruction, is the, is the 10 million, almost 10 million who die and the many millions more who suffer permanent um, disfigurement and, and, and disability. So as, 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 a, as, as, a, as a transformative moment in international politics and in international history, I think it's, um, it, it really is, it, it, really, it really does deserve that, um, that that um, that description of being sort of a foundational moment in uh, in the history of the 20th century. One of the things that seems to me that can never be emphasized enough is the sheer destructiveness, as you say, mm. of, of the First World War. And your book about the Armenian dimension of the war takes us deeply into one you know terrible episodes, a series of episodes, really, mm. uh, from from that era. But um, before we go to that, capture for us, if you would, um, something more of the the sheer um, bloodletting and destruction that 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 occurred during the First World War. Yes, yeah, so, so as you say, it's not just the, the the amount of deaths, the scale. It's the nature of the deaths that mm -hmm. um, that that I think is important because this is the first war that's fought not only on land and sea but also in the air. So you have four thousand eight hundred British civilians, obviously a 
a small number of the total, but they're killed or wounded in air raids. And the impact that this has psychologically on a generation, the way in which that transforms the way in which the the home front is brought to the um, to, to to into um, this total war. Um, it's the first major use of poison gas on the battlefields. It's the last major war um, where it's in some senses is the sort of culmination of, of the Napoleonic eras. So there's still um, the French are still sort of have have um, in particular have sort of put bayonets um, on on their rifles. But the, it, what we're seeing is sort of a move to a sort of wars, a more mechanized warfare that this doesn't really survive the the sort of the old style of warfare doesn't survive first contact really with the battlefield. Mm -hmm. That you have um, guns and artillery, machine guns and artillery. You also have the use of tanks and really it, it's it's the, the the scale of destruction has just not been possible in previous conflicts in europe at least i mean in, in many senses the american civil war serves mm -hmm. as more of a precursor than anything that we'd seen in europe whether in in terms of um, a, a, a aspects of trench warfare but the way in which societies are mobilized um to fight these total wars but if you look at the battle of the somme on july the 1st 1916 that the bloodiest day of that battle um the the British army suffers more than fifty seven thousand casualties, and I think sometimes that you, we just have to hear those numbers to realise just the scale of destruction. And and you also see the way in which societies are transformed with conscription. Um, um, certainly in Britain, which ha hadn't had it before, I mean, other parts of Europe you do have, but also the way in which um, which women are are brought into um, in, in, into armies and, and into into jobs which they hadn't. Um, 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 played a part in before because so many men are being sent to the front line so this really is a a, um, a, a, a this is a war that which which grips the whole of society in terms of international affairs um the, the first world war was undoubtedly really transformative in many of the ways that you've already mentioned i think you emphasized the destruction of these multinational empires as a mm. consequence of the war um talk if you would though about perhaps the the sort of flip side of that phenomenon the rise of two new powers the united states on the one hand and russia um, on the other, perhaps in a somewhat delayed fashion, given the chaos that ensued immediately after the First World War. But would it be appropriate to think of one of the significances of the First World War is propelling these two new massive land power, uh, massive continent spanning, spanning powers to international dominance? Yeah, I think very much so. And I think um, A.J.P. Taylor, the, um, the, the great British historian of, um, of international relations, finishes his um one of his classic books on the struggle for mastery in Europe um in 1917 1918 because he says that the, the the battle for mastery in Europe which had been fought by intra-european powers is essentially settled by the fact that the the future of Europe will now be decided from without um both um with this with the Soviet Union um, as an extra European power, but also very much the United States. And so 1917 in particular is this pivotal year for this. I think one of the things that I think is important to remember, though, is that I think that that can sometimes be the case when, when we look back. But actually, at the time, um, the British Empire in particular, I think, emerges from the war um, relatively much more powerful than any of its competitors um it's um it, the the expanse of its of its empire really reaches its zenith after the first world war um but and, and even though its economic power had been shifting to the united states and i think 1916 sort of um that marks the sort of the us surpassing britain um as um as sort of um undeniably the greatest industrial power and the greatest financial power in the world, Britain is still a, a pivotal nation um, in almost every single major um, diplomatic struggle. And so it emerges from the war more powerful relatively than, say, the Germans, the French. But I think what's important about it is that this is this is very much relative and it's partly because the united states and as i know we'll get on to this later withdraws from from a major role in international affairs i think it really is um even if it might have seemed on the surface that um that britain remained the world's dominant power 
after the First World War. I think it's it's very much, I think, in reality, the eclipse of this sort of Pax Britannica that had dominated international politics in the 19th century. And really, as, as you say, the moments where Russia moves towards its, um, its as an ideological transformation with the Bolshevik Revolution. But in particular, it's when the United States really announces itself as the world's dominant power. And it's really, I would say, the beginning of what would come to be known as the American century. And of course, the, the, the pattern of American decision making that plays out during the war is, 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 is really fascinating, right? At first, the United States under Woodrow Wilson's leadership stays neutral. And, and this might be what we would expect given broader patterns of the ways mm-hmm. in which the United States in, had engaged in the wider world. The thing that really needs explanation is why in 1917, the United States did something it really had never done before mm-hmm. and intervened in a major great power war. It, here's a question that could keep us busy, no doubt, all day. But uh, give us a brief explanation, uh, as you see it, for why it was, how, how you explain that about face from neutral neutrality in 1914 to intervention in 1917? No, that's that. I mean, it's a fascinating question. And it's one that I think shapes so much of what comes after us as well, because I think it's it's, it's difficult for us to be able to sort of um, um, recall this um, from as, as, as a memory uh, um, in terms of the history of the time. But the way in which people say in the 1930s looked at American entrance into the First World War might be the way to which a subsequent generation looked at American entrance into, say, the Iraq War, where they thought that this was, um, if um, if we look at sort of public opinion in, in the 1930s, there was a sense to which this had been um, something which had been had been seen as a, as a, as a, as a mistake and had been something which had, um, had occurred as a result of... Um, of, of, of um, sort of a, a misdirection in, in US history. And I think as a result, as you say, it becomes an area of real controversy. So for many, the sense is that this was economically motivated, whether it's economically um, because of, because America would benefit um, from, from, from entrance into the world. But I think particularly because of there's a sense to which shadowy interests had played a role in tying America's economic future to the conflict in Europe. And I think in particular, the sense is that sort of East Coast bankers, JP Morgan Jr., and the way in which um, these banking houses funded the British and the French war effort were seen as the sort of the catalyst. Um, um, and we see this right from the beginning of the war where Wilson Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan is very opposed to loans by the United States to the belligerents. Brian says that loans are, uh, and money is the worst form of contraband and that this will ultimately bring the United States into the conflict. So there's there's, there's huge controversy over this. Um, ultimately, the decision is taken, particularly because um, the US is, 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 is in recession in the early years of the war and is pulled out of that recession by a lot of these, um, lot of these war orders and also just by the nature of international law at the time to to have refused to trade um, with either nation would have been seen in some senses as, as an unneutral act. Um, so there's a sense to which for critics, that is the sort of justification. I think that stands up less to actually historical analysis when you look at the motivations that underpin Wilson's decisions. Um, I don't think that really is the driver of American entrance into the First World War in the same way that I think for those who after the Second World War would say, well, we got in because the balance of power was um, was going to be sort of turned against our interests, that this was about our national security in a sort of a narrow sense. We saw the Germans as a threat. We saw their dominance of Europe as a threat. Again, I don't actually see that as playing a major role for President Wilson. Um, There might be some of his advisors who saw that, but Wilson himself is never really susceptible to these ideas of economic or security interests. I think for Wilson, um, there's something quite different going on. And I think to understand um, why the US enters into the war, we have to go into the mind of this um, extremely complex figure um, who, who 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 underpins American foreign policy, and, and we need to understand what his motivations are, rather than projecting back um, things that um, that sort of subsequent generations saw as the reasons for American entrance into the war.
Fantastic, Char Charlie. So, so recently you published this this terrific book, and congratulations, by the way, sharing the burden: the Armenian question, humanitarian intervention, and Anglo-American visions of of global order. Um, it, the book has a lot to say about the growing importance of this sense of mission and purpose in global affairs during the first couple of decades of the 20th century, something that, that played a crucial role, as you've just suggested, in the American decision to enter the war, um, as well as its position in the peace negotiations that, that would follow. How do you account for the rising American commitment that, that was so important for Wilson, but of course predated him to some extent, um, the, the, the rising American commitment to bringing its idealism and its ideological purposes to bear in international affairs. Yes, I, because I think we see a, a real sea change that occurs at the, the end of the, the, uh, the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And I don't necessarily buy the idea that Americans are disinterested in global affairs in the 19th century, that this is an era of, of complete isolation. There's very much a, a great deal of interest by Americans in affairs beyond um, their borders, and particularly with events in um, in 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 Asia, um, in in the Americas, and increasingly in Europe as well. And there's support and sympathy for, say, minority groups or um, uh, nations um, who are sort of looking to secure their independence. The the Greek cause in the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s is sort of a, a good example, or the treatment of Russian Jews in um, in Tsarist Russia. That these, these are areas that become of concern to Americans. But in the 19th century, the sense is that this is not the appropriate area for the American government to intervene, that if there's going to be support, it be philanthropic, it would be done by private relief initiatives. And what changes at the end of the 19th century is that as the United States emerges as a greater power, that is, it builds up its navy and that it starts to, um, to, to sort of develop the instruments of power, a growing sense of international consciousness um, expands, and there's a sense, a sense of a sense that America's power brings with it a certain sense of responsibility, but also a sense of opportunity to shape the world outside its borders in its own interests, and also not just in its interests, but to shape a world that would reflect its values as well. And I think you start to see that, um, and part of the reason why sharing the Bergen's focus is on the issue of, um, of, of the Armenians as a particularly important issue is that you start to see this in the mid 1890s with the first massacres, first large scale massacre of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, when Americans become very much animated by what occurs there, 100,000 Armenians are killed in the Ottoman Empire. And there's a, um, there's a great deal of interest because of American missionary, um, of the American missionary presence in the Ottoman Empire, that it becomes a sense that when the Europeans fail to intervene on behalf of the Armenians, that the United States looks to what's going on in the Ottoman Empire and increasingly says, well, the Europeans have sort of failed in their moral responsibility and we are going to intervene in Cuba, which is essentially our Armenia. What's occurring in, um, in the Spanish um, imperial possession of Cuba is, um, is akin to what's occurring in the Ottoman Empire, whether that's fair or not, but as a metaphor, it becomes very important. And what we see at the turn of the 20th century is a growing sense that America can start to um, use its power to, um, to right wrongs in the world. And we see that in relation to the Armenians, where there's a big debate about this. It doesn't lead to any action, but it leads to a growing consciousness. It leads to military intervention on behalf of the Cubans, not the only reason, of course, but there is a, there's an important humanitarian underpinnings of this there's diplomatic interventions on behalf of russian jews and so there's there's a growing um, sort of sense of consciousness but at the same time there's also a sense which american presidents recognize that america's interests don't extend that far and that the american public will not support these interventions and that even america's um, imperial expansion into the philippines americans grow disinterested in that quite quickly so there's this sort of there's this burst of enthusiasm for a greater global role that then dissipates in the early 20th century. And what we see when we get to 1914 is that you have um, you have leaders who um, like Theodore Roosevelt, 
and then ultimately Woodrow Wilson, who believed that the US should take on a larger global role, but at the same time, a recognition that the public may not support it. So what's important is, is an understanding of these sort of ideological underpinnings and the way in which the First World War comes as the United States is starting to awaken to responsibilities in the world. So take us inside Woodrow Wilson's head. <laughs> <laughs> How, under now the conditions of, of war, which present some opportunities for the United States to exert its power, um, how does he think about um, American war aims? Um, once the United States is embroiled in the war, um, how does his thinking evolve with respect to the kind of peace that the United States was seeking through its belligerency? Yes, yeah, so I think Wilson is, is, is as I say, he's, he's not an easy figure to um, to completely under, understand him. He, he when, when going through his writings, he is someone who uses very um, high-minded idealistic phrases, but is a much more uh, practical politician than I think sometimes he's given credit for. He's always seen as the sort of the high-minded idealist, I think probably because he was a university professor, um, that he's sort of, um, as um, as Phil mentioned, his religious background, I think is very, very important to him. And I think it's critical to understand him. Um, but I think he is much more pragmatic. And we see that right from the beginning of the war. His decision to say that the United States should remain neutral in thought as well as in action is dictated by practical political considerations that um, ultimately there's ethnic um, um, societal questions within the United States that it draws its population from many of the belligerents who have sympathies for, for each side, whether it's German Americans, with their sympathy towards the um, towards Germans, or whether it's Irish Americans whose sympathies are against the British. And I think these these are important considerations, Jewish Americans who are opposed to, um, to Tsarist Russia. And what Wilson is trying to manage this, but he also recognizes what I just mentioned before, that Americans are not necessarily interested in getting involved in in, um, in 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 a war overseas, that there's no question in 1914 that the United States would intervene in the conflict. Um, it 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 had um, in in the years previously, particularly under Theodore Roosevelt, had had sort of played um, sort of a very limited role in helping to sort of mediate disputes within Europe. But there's no real sense to which America's core interests are taught, are caught up in the war, and there's a sense to which Wilson wants to focus on domestic affairs. And also that he's not particularly interested in foreign affairs. And the great quote which um, which Wilson makes on the way to his inauguration in 1912 um, is that it would be the irony of fate if my foreign policy, if my if, sorry, if my presidency was to deal mainly with foreign policy because all my training has been in domestic affairs. Mm -hmm. And obviously that irony of fate sits very um, sits very heavy when the US enters the First World War. But I think that quotation actually can sometimes mislead because Wilson had developed some quite clear ideas about America's foreign policy, about its role in the world, which um, had, had occurred, and in some senses were actually more definite than his views on domestic politics. Mm -hmm. And they essentially amount to this belief that the United States has a certain responsibility to provide a certain leadership towards the establishment of a more democratic world that um, that essentially, as he says in his, um, his election campaign in 1912, the United States is chosen and prominently chosen to show the way to the nations of the world how to walk in the path of liberty. And that really does reflect um, an important part of Wilson's worldview, that he believes that the US has this leadership role and Prior to American entrance into the war, there's a sense to which it will provide that leadership through peaceful means, that it will bring the, the nations together, um, that it will help to mediate this dispute, and that this will be a means towards the United States playing a more active role in world affairs. And he's trying to keep the United States out. Um, you get um, uh, the sinking of the Lusitania, famously in 1915, which is sort of thinking of the Lusitania is almost a bit like um, September the 11th or Jennifer, John F. Kennedy's assassination, where everyone who was alive at the time would be able to tell you where they were 
when that event occurred. And it's not because that inevitably was going to bring the United States into the First World War. It's more that it made the entrance in the United States into the war a possibility in a way that it hadn't existed before. And Wilson quite quite sort of um, cleverly politically, having made a sort of a, a rhetorical misstep at the beginning, he, he says that there's such a thing as a, as a man being too proud to fight, of a nation being so right that it doesn't have to prove itself by fighting, that causes huge outrage, particularly for those who believe in intervention like Theodore Roosevelt. But after that, Wilson is 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 um, is quite um, savvy in the way in which he gets the Germans to commit to um, to no longer engaging in unrestricted submarine warfare. And what Wilson does is that he positions himself between the more aggressive, belligerent interventionists like Theodore Roosevelt and those who are fundamentally opposed to entrance into the war, like his Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who resigns over Wilson's handling of the Lusitania dispute. So Wilson sort of judges American public opinion well. And I think that's the thing which we see throughout the war years is that Wilson is very much in step with American public opinion. He doesn't want to get too far ahead of it. And I think that's something which we should bear in mind because our memories of him are very much dictated by what happens afterwards of him being an idealist who ultimately loses the support of the American public for most of the time during the war years, he is very effective at keeping um, in line with American public opinion. But I think what, what occurs out of the Lusitania dispute is a sense to which he is no longer in control of America's destiny. If Germany decides at any point to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, then that will fundamentally change the picture. That, uh, that and, I, and, I, and we we can talk about what occurs once Germany does that at the beginning of 1917, because obviously Wilson um, wins re-election as the man who keeps America out of war in 1916 by a very narrow margin against um, the Republican Charles Evans Hughes. But he knows in that campaign that he's not really in control of, 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 of things. And, and when Germany does decide to resume unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917, it presents him with this huge dilemma. Charlie, you mentioned the democratization of international affairs is one of those core ideas that sat at the center of Wilson's thinking. Another term uh, that, of course, springs to mind quickly with respect to Wilson is self-determination. Mm. Um, talk a little bit about self-determination. I think this connects um, uh, the subject of Wilsonianism generally to the subject of your book. So perhaps you could tell us something about how Wilson's thinking about self-determination and what the world should look like after the conclusion of the fighting um, you know, would look like in the part of the world that uh, most interests you. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating how much Wilson becomes associated with self-determination because it's not actually an expression that he uses in the 14 points, even though we tend to think of Wilson as the as the, uh, as sort of the advocate of self-determination. And Wilson has a slightly different idea about it. I mean, in many senses, he uses, as I say, this very sort of highfalutin rhetoric, uh, idealist rhetoric, but in relation to self-determination, he has a slightly different idea to that which is ultimately attributed to him. He's not necessarily a believer that every people should have their own nation. He is, and it goes back to this belief that anyone can be sort of um, trained in the in the in 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 to to, to be self-governing. And I think that's what we see right. That his sense of self-determination is that people can be taught. To, to basically govern themselves. And I think that that distinction becomes important for why he doesn't sort of as sort of wholeheartedly reject um, the imperial world model um, as I think many of his, um, his supporters at the time believe that he's going to. And I think we see that, um, and you, you were mentioning in relation to the Ottoman Empire, Wilson, when the US enters the war, in 1917 against Germany. And it does so, I think the main reason I would say that the US does that is because Wilson cannot see a possibility. I mean, he, and he tries very hard after January 1917 when when, when Germany um, declares unrestricted summer warfare, he doesn't immediately move towards a request for a declaration of war. He tries almost everything in that two or three months after, um, afterwards to keep the US still out of the conflict. Even the Zimmerman telegram, even though that, that leads 
to this huge um, outpouring of aggression against Germany when the German foreign minister is um, um, the telegram which he sends to the Mexican government about reclaiming um, Texas and other areas that had been lost in the um, um, to, to the United States previously, and it causes a huge um, controversy when this is revealed by British intelligence um, and arouses sort of interventionist opinion, even among those who'd been quite um, isolationist in the Midwest in particular. Wilson is still hesitating on this. He's still trying to keep the US out of the war. And what occurs in, in, um, in March and April 1917 is that um, Americans are, are killed on the high seas um, but shot by um, by German um, submarines, and Wilson sees no um, course compatible with American honor um, to keep the U.S. out of war. That it's not possible to have what he called for peace with honor. It, it, America can't remain can't can't keep honor if it allows its citizens to be killed. That that becomes the sort of the deciding force for Wilson. But as I say, he brings the U.S. into the war against Germany. He doesn't bring the U.S. into war initially against Austria-Hungary. He changes that in um, December of 1917, but he never brings the U.S. into the war against the Ottoman Empire, one of Germany's other allies, which I think is often forgotten. And he doesn't, he, he's much more circumspect in terms of one um, intervening outside of um of these other, he sees Germany very much as the main antagonist. He's very much aware that American public opinion might not support a widening of the war, um, but he also doesn't call for the dismantlement of these multi-ethnic empires because he doesn't think that that's necessarily in, US, in the U.S. interest. He sees them as vassals of Germany and wants to detach them. So even though, as we say, he he's seen as the prophet of self-determination, he he. In 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 the fourteen points, he's not actually calling for the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is which is remarkable for the way in which we remember him afterwards. He he's actually looking at ways that sort of autonomy can be given to to nations within the Ottoman Empire, within the within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but not necessarily the breakup of that empire. So his conception of self determination is much more limited, at least during the war years. It expands afterwards. Charlie, it seems to me one of the principles that Wilson indisputably talked about during the war, and then of course would become central to his peace agenda after the war, was the League of Nations, right? Mm -hmm. This new collective security instrument that he believed would be a cornerstone of preventing more more great power wars and preserving peace into the indefinite future. Um, clearly, this was part of the the agenda that he took with him as he set off for Europe. Um, uh, once the once the fighting was over, we can now see, with the benefit of hindsight, that though Wilson was very popular, Wilsonian ideas were very popular among European opinion. There were nevertheless some problems. There were problems with the attitude of the attitudes of the other great powers that would come to Versailles uh, and sit across the conference tables, mm -hmm. and of course there were problems ultimately on the American home front. So let's let's talk a little bit about each one of those. Um, first of all, with the other great powers, um, what were the obstacles that Wilson had to contend with and how did he do in defending his position against uh, the, the, the other major voices at the conference? Yes, as you say, he, he, when, when the United States enters the war, um, a concert of three nations is sort of put into the American Declaration of War right from April 1917. Wilson is very much committed to, to the League. He's not the first um, American statesman to start talking about um, the, the idea of a League of Nations. People on the Republican side, like Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge, had started talking about it previously. But Wilson really comes to own that idea as the war goes on. And his his sense of um, of what he wants to achieve is, as you say, quite different to what the British and French are trying to achieve. And I, I don't necessarily um, buy the um, the sort of traditional idea of sort of Lloyd George and Clemenceau as being the sort of um, the figures of reaction. I think they have their own visions of of slightly different. Um, I, mean, I mean, they're not they're not looking back to the 19th century. I and mean, even if they're trying to learn lessons from it, they have a sense of a, of a different sort of world that they want to emerge out of the war. But it's a very different one to what Woodrow Wilson is 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 advocating. So for Lloyd George um, and the British, there's a sense of um, of the British 
um, emerging from this war more consolidated and more sort of a greater Britain where um, where the British Empire is sort of moving towards its idea of a Commonwealth. And for Lloyd George, there's a recognition that he wants to tie the United States much more closely into international affairs through an Anglo-American alliance. That's sort of the, the great goal. And in some senses, Clemenceau wants something similar for the French. He wants a security guarantee by the British and Americans for France, which again is very different to what the French have been um, have been doing in the 19th century. There's a recognition that France can't stand alone against Germany. So they want internationalism, but they want a different sort of internationalism. It's one that would also protect their empires. And for Wilson, his sense of, of, um, of this is, is, as I say, ties into this idea of American leadership, but of a more democratic um, global order. Um, and I, I don't mean democratic in the sense that it's going to be sort of a universalist sort of end to empire, but there's a sense to which imperial competition between the great powers has led to this war. And he wants to see um, no expansion really of these empires that would lead to competition between them. He's not opposed to empire per se. He's opposed to imperial competition between the European powers that he believes had led to the war in the first place. And so that becomes a major clash at the peace conference as the, the British and the French are trying to um, aggrandize, get um, get benefits that come out of the war, which they believe they're entitled to, not just the British and the French, but the Italians, the Japanese, and many others as well. The United States has less of a desire for possessions, for expanding and, 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 an, and establishing a sort of a colonial empire and that becomes sort of the basis of many of these um, disagreements um, and Wilson really puts the League of Nations as as the sort of the embodiment of his new vision of an international order and that that will help to um, to really to, to correct any of the problems that emerge out of the war that aren't settled immediately by the peace and that the United States has to take on the leadership of that new League of Nations, that it's that's its that's its destiny in the world. Ultimately, of course, it would be the American home front mm. in particular that would decide the fate of the League. And we all know Woodrow Wilson's vision of collective security and Wilsonianism in many ways more broadly came to a crashing end with the defeat um, of, of the League. Um, Wilson has sometimes been criticized for being too obstinate, being too unwilling to compromise. Um, wh where do you stand on that? Uh, could, can Wilson reasonably be criticized for a kind of obstinacy that ultimately led to failure where there might have been possibilities of a different outcome? I think our image of Wilson is very much tied up with the idea that comes when he comes to Europe in at the end of 1918, where he's greeted by this remarkable outpouring of emotion and um, and celebration, uh, millions of people lining the streets in Paris and Rome and London, and, and there's a sense to which Wilson is this um, almost messianic figure um, that he sort of um, I think H. G. Wells talks about him standing alone for mankind. The sense to which he has occupied this 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 remarkable role. Um, and John Maynard Keynes, the British economist, talks about him as um, he said, um, Keynes has this wonderful phrase where he says, never has a philosopher held so many um, weapons wherewith to bind the princes of the world. And there's a sense to which when we look at Wilson at that point, he seems all powerful. He seems in this position that he's able to shape the world as he wants to. And I think what's important to remember are the constraints on him. He, he is obviously having to negotiate with um, with the Europeans, particularly when Americans want to bring their troops back. There's a sense to which Wilson is um, actually has far fewer weapons than it might initially seem, both militarily, but also economically. I mean, America might be this major economic power, but the loans which it has put out to the allies, um, most Americans and certainly most American politicians in Congress believe that those loans are things which have to be collected on. There's not things where Wilson um, is able to sort of forgive loans in, in, in response in order to achieve his objectives. I mean, he he is having to work with Congress and he's having to work with um, with with other leaders. And there's 
I think sometimes a sense to which everything can be controlled by Paris, but events are occurring in Europe, which things are moving, pieces are moving on the chess pe- chessboard, which the players can't always control. I think within the United States as well, there's a growing um, um, sort of, I think a, a sense to which um, the, the sort of the, the idealism that I think is there um, at different points in the war is starting to dissipate. There's a sense to which America is going to be manipulated into underwriting a piece that will not be in its interests. And increasingly, there's not, there's, we see sort of an opposition to Wilson from the sort of more irreconcilable isolationist senators, but there's also a critique of him from those on the Republican side who have a different vision. They're internationalists, but have a very different vision to Wilson. And I think it's the, it ultimately becomes the alliance between those figures that essentially brings him down. I think, I think he, he, he is certainly um, too stubborn in terms of compromising. Um, and I would say particularly domestically, I think for those Republican internationalists like Henry Cabot Lodge and Eli Root and Charles Evans Hughes, William Howard Taft, they are open to American entrance into a league, but they don't want one which has such all-encompassing commitments as Wilson wants. Um, they want much more specific, more narrow commitments. So I think there is a very valid critique that Wilson is too stubborn. On the flip side, um, I think there is a sense to which the debate over the league pushes people to very hardline positions. And it's not entirely clear um, within that debate that if Wilson had made more concessions, that he necessarily would have been able to bring the US in as as a leader of global affairs, which is what he wanted. So there becomes this sort of incompatibility between his vision and um, and the other internationalists. So um, yes, he's he's too stubborn and he's 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 unwilling to compromise. Um, but I think he. Um, I think it, this is something which is, I think, baked into his vision from the, from the outset that America has to take on the leadership of the world, or it, or, 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 or there's no point. Um, which I think is is, a, is is quite an inflexible position. Charlie, it seems to me a, a lot of historians have pointed to the irony that Wilson failed in many ways at the end of his presidency to achieve much of this grand international vision, and yet over the long term many historians would say his ideas prevailed. Uh, We have lived for many years, many decades in a Wilsonian era. Um, How do you think about that, that contention? What what is Wilson's legacy in in our own era in the 21st century? I think it's it's a very, it's it's a challenging question today. I think because of Wilson's domestic views on race, I think um, the, we, we very much, um, um, the sense of him, the image of him as the, sort of the great idealist, has started to be eroded in that sense because of his um, of the fact that sort of segregationist policies are put in place during his administration, and and many of his um, his views on race um, are are, um, are 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 quite are quite regressive, and we see that um, with his um, his famous um, quote about. Um, birth of a nation after it's um, um viewed in the um in the white house that this is like history written with lightning the, the quotation that's attributed to him and i think as a result wilson's views have um have, have seen him lose some of the sheen that he that he had for for quite a long time in the 20th century as this sort of great um advocate of of idealism i do think in relation to foreign policy in particular there are aspects of wilson's ideas which because of the all-encompassing universalist nature of his rhetoric that actually were able to be picked up by people that he didn't necessarily intend them to. And um, the the Wilsonian moment of 1919 is very real. People around the world are inspired by his ideas of self-determination. And there is this long-lasting vision of internationalism and interconnection that people are inspired by. Um, and I think we see him, his his vision, as we've just said, being sort of quite decisively defeated and rejected in um, in 1919, that he is unable to bring the US into the league um, as, as a leader in global affairs. But I think one of the things I think 
sort of demonstrates the importance of it when the US emerges out of isolation in the 1930s to take on this leading role in um in 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 fighting against the 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 um the revisionist powers in Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and Mussolini's Italy. It does so to a certain extent under the banner of the same ideals that Wilson had been expressing um during during the First World War and its aftermath. And I think that that's partly why even sort of such a great foe of of Wilson uh, Wilson's ideas is Henry Kissinger, the great realist um, to Wilson's sort of idealist. Kissinger says that Wilson's intellectual victory is greater than any political victory could ever have been because they bec his ideas become the bedrock of American um, foreign policy ever since. So I think there is a sense there, but I also think we that he 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 certainly was um, he certainly um, um, elements of him are redeemed in in. Um, during the Second World War and its aftermath. But I think it's almost a combination of the vision that Wilson represents and the vision that his great antagonist, Theodore Roosevelt, represents. And that I think there's it, it's it's no um it's it's no coincidence that it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt who serves as Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Wilson and is um is obviously a relative of Theodore Roosevelt, who combines their two visions in the most coherent concerted way and i think in many senses it's 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 the way in which he is able to bring both aspects of them together that becomes the underpinnings of american foreign policy in the second world war and its aftermath uh, i want to remind uh all of the folks listening to this conversation that there's um, an opportunity to enter questions into the Q&A feature. So by all means, please uh, put your questions there and I'll, I'll turn it over to Sandy Kress for the Q&A in, in just a moment. But Charlie, I can't, I can't let you go without calling attention to the fact that not only have you published Sharing the Burden, but also uh, a book that you've co-authored with Brendan Sims called Hitler's American Gamble. And you are, Charlie, an expert not just in the First World War and Wilsonianism, but really in the interwar period. Let me ask you to connect these two books in a sense. Um, you know, it, it's often claimed that the Second World War flowed from the flaws of the peace settlement of the First World War. There's kind of a direct connection between the, these two things. I wonder what your response is to, to that sort of claim, given that you've really worked at both ends of that time period. Um, I think for a long time, there was, um, there was a great deal of criticism, as you say, of the peacemakers in Paris, their, their inability to construct a world um that that would prevent the war that would that in the the famous um phrase of marshal foch the um, the french military leader that they that they had only been able to put in place a 20 year armistice that they aren't able to achieve um the nirvana of a um of a sort of a a more permanent peace in paris I, i'm i'm i find myself more sympathetic to the ideas that they were that they they that that their their agency was much more limited than we tend to um, that, that than that sort of um, orthodox interpretation that criticizes and tends to um, tends to impose there. I think Margaret Macmillan, um, whose whose wonderful book um, um, Paris nineteen nineteen has this has this great phrase talking about this sort of clash between um, leaders in um, in Paris and um, and and um, who are drawing lines on maps, and then there's armies moving in Europe, that they are very, that it's very difficult for, for, these, for these leaders to actually constrain what's going on um, elsewhere in Europe. And I think the sense to which, and I think most of the scholarship now shows that the First World War in many senses doesn't end in 1918, 1919. It continues in many parts of, um, of Central and Eastern Europe well into the early 1920s, certainly probably up to 1923, I think, a greater war occurs, um, which the Great War is part of. And I think there's a war weariness in, in Europe and the United States. And I think as a result, the, the leaders are, 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 are less able to constrain um, revisions to the, to the treaty, that they can come up with certain settlements, but they don't necessarily survive first contact with with events on the ground and i think 
we see this in relation to um to central europe for for a long time there's criticism as i say of wilson's ideas on self determination in relation to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it leaves this vacuum in Central Europe. Well, I, I think it's very hard for the peacemakers to keep in place the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Do they make mistakes? Legions of them. They make um, they, they make all manner of of of, uh, of mistakes um, um, at that time. But I do think that that they wouldn't have been able to keep the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There was always going to be a certain vacuum, and I think once self-determination is applied. To a certain extent, Germany is going to emerge out of this era as still the most powerful country in Europe. And so I, I, I certainly think they deserve to be criticised for their mistakes. But I don't think that they could, I don't think, I, th I think that, that they could, they would have found it very difficult to constrain some of the sort of larger structural forces in international politics that lead to the rise of Germany that lead to the United States not necessarily be willing to take on um, political commitments. I think the US is, is quite averse to commitments after the First World War, and they're certainly averse to Wilson's sort of very overarching vision, but it's not clear that they would have taken on even the more narrow commitments of a security guarantee for France, for example. That sort of um, goes by the wayside in 1919. So Yes, they make mistakes, um, the um, the peacemakers, but I think a rising Germany, a more um, a more restrained United States, a Soviet Union that is um, in in uh, sort of is is in an antagonistic relationship with uh, with the West. Those things I think are are almost certainly going to be baked into the international system um, after the First World War. So they could have mitigated them. I don't think they could have prevented um, um, many of the problems in the international system. Well, Charlie Laterman, I'm sure we could keep talking all afternoon or all night in your case. Uh, <laughs> thank you very sincerely for spending time with us uh, this afternoon for us and, and uh, throughout the, the, the late night for you. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to let you go without saying, again, congratulations on these two really tremendous books, Sharing the Burden and Hitler's American Gamble. Charlie, thanks again. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let me turn the floor over to Sandy Kress, who will moderate the Q&A session. Thank you, Mark. Charlie, good to be with you. Um, I want to uh, start uh, with a question uh, that mixes uh, me putting on, you on the spot, uh, sort of in a real politics sense, mm. uh, with a question that was posed in the in the uh, Q and A as well. Um, so we're in Versailles, and as I understand it, and as the questioner understands it, um, uh, Wilson had a concern about the demand for excessive German reparations in exchange, but, but, was all, but was also obviously deeply committed to getting the major powers to back the 14 points. Uh, the understanding is that he went, that he uh, fought harder for the latter and sort of gave in on the former. Now, first of all, is that true? And if it is, uh, would, uh, in the interest of peace in the world, would we have been better off if he had pushed for the former and not for the latter? I mean, that perhaps had he stressed the importance of not demanding these excessive reparations, uh, would that have had a, a, a felicitous effect on, uh, on Germany and perhaps had some effect in, in avoiding uh, the economic collapse and the extremism that followed? Yeah, I think it's it's a really good question. I think what's interesting with Wilson, I mean, obviously we can't talk about this without talking about his, the state of his health as well and the way in which um, I think he de certainly becomes more rigid and inflexible. As I mentioned previously, I think one of the things that's remarkable about Wilson during the war years and beforehand is how adept he is as a politician in measuring American public opinion and changing his policies to reflect that. And I think during the peace conference in the aftermath, he becomes much more hardline, much more inflexible in pursuit of a, of a, of a vision that he, that he clearly believes of American leadership of, of the global order. And I think the league is sort of, is part of that, but he, he becomes much more 
um, hard line in the tactics for pursuing that. And I think his position on the reparations is interesting. He, he's very much a critic of it in the early part of the of the conference. But by the end of the conference, when John Maynard Keynes and others are trying to get him to row back on that and to try and get him to speak to the French um, on this, Wilson actually, um, just, he, he he's very clear that he thinks that the Germans are, have been responsible for the war and need to be punished. And partly, I think this is because, as I say, he becomes more hardline um, during the conference as a result of his illness. But also, I think he believes that he's been able to establish um, a position that is going to get support at home, because I think it's important to remember Wilson loses the congressional elections in 1918. The Democrats lose the election when Wilson goes to the American people and says to return um, a Democratic Congress as a validation of his vision and it's rejected and the vision that the american public are supporting is more theodore roosevelt's vision at the time which says we shouldn't be making peace to the chatter of typewriters but to the hammer of guns and there's a sense to which the american public are moving away from wilson's vision to roosevelt's tougher vision and so in some senses wilson thinks well if we're, we're tough on the germans in terms of reparations then that will ultimately bring them around to support for the treaty and for membership of the League of Nations. And I think he, um, he he's not wrong in the sense to which the American public have, have, have become um, um, more strict on this. They, 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 they do believe the Germans need to be punished. But I think he's wrong to believe that this is going to lead to the US taking on these commitments, because I think by any measurement, by 1919, most Americans are not willing to take on the sort of commitments that he believes they should do. Thank you for addressing his health. That was another uh, part of the question, was whether his declining health uh, in Paris contributed uh, to the way he operated there. Let me take you uh, deeper into uh, a question Mark asked you about the politics. Uh, and I'm curious, again, this may relate to his health. It may relate to a variety of other factors, but uh, I was intrigued by your discussion about the diversity of feeling among Republicans. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, and again, uh, whether it would have been in his interest to have brought some in to the negotiation of the treaty. My, read, my understanding is he brought no Republican in on the negotiating of the treaty. Uh, had he, do you think he could have had more success politically? I think that, that it, so he, he does bring in um, a couple of Republicans into his confidence. So Henry White, a former diplomat who had been close to Theodore Roosevelt, to Henry Cabot Lodge, to Elihai Root, the sort of big um, figures in the Republican Party. White is a member of the delegation, but he, as you say, he's not a he's not a leading figure. Um, and I think that is a huge mistake. Um, people like Colonel House are pushing for him to bring Elihai Roots, who'd been a Secretary of State, Secretary of War, and a Nobel Prize winner, to bring him into um, the tent. And I think this is a this is a major mistake that, that Wilson makes. I mean, he and I think those who are sort of partisans of Wilson would say, where well, their vision of the world is so different to Wilson that it would have been a mistake. But I, I think um, this is something which Franklin Roosevelt. Um, um, really looks to address um, in the Second World War and with with the sort of establishment of, um, of of Bretton Woods and the United Nations of bringing the Republicans on board. So I think that is definitely the case. And I think one of the other things I think what, what's really interesting within this the clash between Roosevelt and Wilson is fundamental to this. Um, and I think for during the war and, and there's been a long sort of this image that Wilson is the sort of idealist and Roosevelt's um, the realist. And I think um, John Milton Cooper, who wrote a, an excellent book called The Warrior and the Priest, which people may be interested in, what he showed, and I think very sort of adeptly, is that in many senses, Roosevelt is, is actually far more idealistic, certainly during the war, than Wilson is. And his frustration, and, and many of the Republicans' frustrations with Wilson, is that he their sense is that he uses idealistic language without any sense of believing in, in these things. So, so as I say, people like Roosevelt and Lodge are believers that the US should have gone to war against the Ottoman Empire um, um, on behalf of the Armenians. Wilson is opposed to this. He believes that actually the US is engaged in a war with Germany. It, it's a much more sort of narrow conflict. And so in that sense, 
Wilson is actually quite practical um, and and it's it's Roosevelt who's the more sort of crusading figure. So I think there's there's that clash between the two. But I do think um, more attention really does need to be paid to sort of the conservative internationalist, the Republican internationalist, who have a very different vision of international affairs um, that I think is one that, that, that there may have been more support for, while at the same time, I think it's something that the fact is that, yes, yes, um, he could have brought these people on board, um, but the nature of the league fight becomes so fractious that by by the end of 1919 and by 1920, I think it's too late. And I think you see that even after the um, when Warren Harding comes in and brings in a number of these figures like Charles Evans Hughes, like Herbert Hoover, who had been sympathetic towards membership of the league. But obviously they don't move to membership of the league in the 1920s because they know the American public just would not support it. So I think public opinion had shifted as and I think it, it's not static um so he certainly should have done more at the beginning but the nature of the league fight just pushes um sort of compromise out the window it becomes much more black and white thank you charlie thank you for bringing up uh the issue of the armenian uh problem we had several questions along those lines you brought up uh, colonel house uh, mm-hmm. uh i want you to spend just a minute or two i want to try to get a couple more questions in uh, but could you talk a, a moment about uh, President Wilson's relationship with Colonel House? And I'm interested, as you talk about it, why he didn't listen to him uh, in terms of negotiating partners uh, at the end on on the league. But Colonel House and President Wilson. Yeah, House is a fascinating figure. I mean, he really is the sort of the uh, the sort of um, one of one of these early sort of foreign policy advisors, and um, he, um, I think is sort of seen by the British in particular as sort of the, um, I'm trying to think which which British politician describes him as sort of the, um, the sort of um, the human intercessor to uh, to Wilson as this sort of like ethereal figure. And I think um, that's, I mean, it's House who's liaising with people like the British Foreign Secretary, Edward Gray, and who's, who I think is, um, is much more attuned to European opinion. I mean, Wilson, I think, has a certain image of European opinion that comes from his connection with the more sort of um, liberal figures. But I think House is closer um, to, um, to, to, to the policymaking leaders within, um, within Europe. But I, and, I, and as I say, when I, mean, I was mentioning at the beginning, I think House is more sympathetic to that idea that the US should have intervened in, in the war earlier on the basis that the balance of power was going against Britain and that a German dominated Europe was not in America's interest. But Wilson doesn't really listen to him on this. Um, and I think that's that's important to remember because we see that also during the peace conference as well. House is important as a guide and as an advisor, but on the big issues, Wilson knows his own mind and House is important as a sort of, uh, as an agent, as an interlocutor. But it, when House starts to sort of step outside of that role at, at Versailles, he's, Wilson believes, I think possibly unfairly, the House has sort of ste- gone, gone beyond um, what, what, he, what his instructions are. Um, and as a result, that falling out occurs in Paris. And I think part of the, um, the problem that Wilson has um, in the later stages of, um, of, of discussions with the Republicans um, and in relation to the um, to 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 the, to, um, to the treaty, is that he doesn't have any sort of sage political advice around him. He sort of jettisons and House and others, but there's no. I mean, he doesn't listen to him um, at the peace conference. There's no indication he would have listened to him at that point either. So House is is is, is important and interesting, but he's not decisive in shaping Wilson's views. Gotcha. One last question. Uh, uh, it, it relates to religion. Um, mm. Wilson was a Presbyterian elder, uh, president previously president of Princeton with, with its uh, preeminent seminary uh, and a Presbyte- uh, going all the way back. Do you believe that Presbyterian theology, do you have any sense that Presbyterian theology affected Wilson's policies, uh, particularly his foreign policy? I, I think more so than I think it um I, I think I think there is definitely a sense to which um to which Wilson 
um, his views of the world are, are influenced by religion. And I think you see that in relation to the Ottoman Empire, the people that he brings around him, um, his, um, his, his major donor for his presidential campaign in 1912 and 1916 is Cleveland Dodge, um, who um, had also uh, been a classmate of his at Princeton, but is a leading backer of missionary institutions um, in, in the Middle East. Um, and I think Wilson's interest in what's going on in the Ottoman Empire is, is, is partly influenced by Dodge. Um, and so I, I think he, he very much is influenced by his Presbyterianism, but I don't think it's... Um, I'm not sure if it's necessarily decisive in um, in in his. I mean, it certainly leads to sort of a his belief in a certain destiny of America's role in the world. But it's it's hard to separate that from his sort of broader belief in American civil religion of of manifest destiny. I, I think there's there's as I say practical elements in terms of his support for missionary groups and his support for um, um, for um, um, sort of religious organizations but I, I think in terms of his larger foreign policy philosophy it's sort of part of it but I'm not sure if it if it necessarily is is determinative um, but other scholars um, would argue differently and I think that is a really important new area of research which I think for a long time was sort of was sort of a throwaway line that he was sort of a child of the manse and that was important to to understand his worldview and um, but at the same time I, I don't think people have sort of dug into the um, the nuances of his theology, and and I, and I wouldn't necessarily call myself an expert on that. Um, from everything I see, it sort of complements his um, his belief in manifest destiny and, and America's civil religion, rather than being something that's sort of necessarily separate from it. Charlie, I could go on and on. Thank you so much. It's been fabulous for me and for our audience. I now want to pass the baton over to Phil to uh, bring us to uh, a conclusion. Thank you, Charlie, <laughs> very, very much. It's been a terrific afternoon. And Mark and Sandy, thank you both. I do want, uh, in closing, to acknowledge the endorsement of our program this year by the Humanities Texas, whose programs advance education by seeking to improve the quality of classroom teaching and supporting libraries and museums and creating opportunities for lifelong learning, of course, we at Ollie completely endorse. Many of us in the audience are members of UT Ollie, of Friends of the LBJ Library, or perhaps both. If not, please check us out. Both UT Ollie and the Friends of the LBJ offer a wide variety of outstanding in-person and virtual programs, just as you've seen today with the distinguished scholar, Charlie Label. And thank all of you for tuning in. We will be back next Thursday, January 19 at 4 p.m. for a conversation with Elizabeth Barron, a University of Virginia historian about Abraham Lincoln and the end of the Civil War. We hope to see you next time. Again, thank you, Charlie, and good night.